which means if you see that sometimes candles are white and sometimes they're yellow. Like the Hanukkah candles also, they're yellow. The yellow means it's from the wax of bees. One of the reasons for that is because for the word for beeswax in Hebrew is shiva. Shin, ayin, vav, hey. And those four letters are an acronym of the words where it says in the Torah, hikitsu, ranenu, sheikhne, ofer. Which means that those who lie in the dust, those who are, are unfortunately not here, will rise again with Mashiach. By the davening, the Rebbe said there should be five candles lit. Five candles. Why five? That's because the soul has five names. Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chaya, Yechid. So these are all things that don't necessarily apply to you, but again, to know what's being done. The one thing that does apply to you is when the Rebbe says that everybody should give tzedakah before chakras and give tzedakah before mincha. Say, this week at Shabbos, we can do that. So on a Shabbos, we give tzedakah on Friday and we give additional tzedakah on Sunday. By the way, you can also do tzedakah on Shabbos. I think I told you the story. I was very impressed. It was Rosh Hashanah this year. I'm sitting in the shul, crowded shul, and there's a young boy about 15 years old sitting next to me. And he says, I'm stepping out now. Is there anything I can get you? A drink of water? I said, whoa, I haven't ever heard that before. But that was very nice, very nice. I told him I haven't ever heard that before. So he said, my mashpia told us that before davening, you're supposed to give tzedakah. But on Shabbos, you can't give tzedakah. So try to do a favor to someone before davening. Mm. Very good, very nice. So actually, you could do tzedakah even on Shabbos. It was timed by Fabrengen, where the Rebbe said everybody should give tzedakah, but it's a Fabrengen, it's Shabbos. So give the person next to you a chayim, or give him a piece of cake. It's also a form of tzedakah. Also, before Shachris, again, these are not things that you have to do. I'm just telling you what's being done. One should learn a chapter of Tanya, but by Mincha, it should be after Mincha to learn a chapter of Tanya, any chapter. And another thing where the Rebbe says, and that's relevant. I spoke about it yesterday to the other class. That's relevant to everybody that on a day like this, we write a pan, nefesh, which is a note where we're asking, we we're asking for the Rebbe to, to pray for us. And um, I made these copies because the pan is written in a specific text. I gave out a lot yesterday, the son of Yamasin. On top, you write Peinun, which stands for Pidjan Nefesh. Next to it, you write the Rebbe's title, Kvot Kudosh Sadmar. And then these words mean, I'm asking the Rebbe to arouse Hashem's mercy. And then you write your name and your mother's name. And you can use this actual sheet to just continue writing your name and your mother's name on it, or you can copy and write the whole thing in your own words. So if you don't mind passing some down this side and passing down some down that side. And I just remember I put something downstairs, I must run and get it before. Also, the Rebbe said during the course of the day, everybody should study Mishnayas. Mishnah is specifically effective. In fact, the word Mishnah is spelled Mem, Shin, Nun, He, which are the same letters as Neshama, Nun, Shin, Mem, He. That means that this part of Torah, when it's studied in the honor of a Neshama, is very effective, very powerful. And during the day, there should be a Fabrengen. People should get together. That's a, 
act of Abbas Yisrael. <clears throat> and also, people should take the time to tell their children, their family, about the previous Rebbe, what he accomplished. And there's one specific thing which Rebbe points out, which is relevant to all of you here, is that to, to go to places wherever you can, speak to the youth, and tell them how much the Rebbe loved the youth and how much confidence he had in them and um, basically to inspire them as much as possible that uh, to realize the power they have, the potential they have and use it to the full extent. So there's two things about today's day. One is that today is the day that, uh, not today, but tonight is the day that the free Rebbe passed, Yud Shvat, and it's also the day that the Rebbe became Rebbe. So first I want to start with saying a few words about the previous Rebbe, and then we'll talk about the Rebbe and specifically how it came about, and in general how it comes about that the Rebbe is chosen. What I'm going to tell you about the Friedrich Grab, I'm passing this around, even though it's just a story I can tell you. I think it's something you should all have. And from time to time, look at it and read it, and it'll be very inspiring. But this story, in a sense, um, thank you. This story gives us a, a, a picture of what the Friedrich Grab was about, because the Friedrich Grab's life was filled with mysterious nefesh was all about putting his life on the line in Russia and in many other ways in, in uh, Poland to spread Yiddishkeit and to strengthen Yiddishkeit. So here's an example of what was all about. So the Friedrich describes what happened shortly after his pa father passed away. And then the Friedrich Rebbe was appointed as the Rebbe. And he was, because it was the year of his father's passing, he was the chazan. He was reciting the davening and leading the davening. In the middle of davening, three people walked in, dressed in uniform, rifles in their hands. Their belt was full of bullets. They had guns in their hands. They had these Kazakh knives, helmets of copper. Their faces were on fire. They walked over to them and said, you are summoned immediately to come with us to the office of the KGB. Then it was called Cheka. And he said, the three people, two of them were Jews, they were Yavsetia, and one of them was an Anju. And the three of answered them, I'm sorry, I'm middle of praying now. When I finish praying, I finish saying the Mishnayas, then I'll go along with you. So the two Jews were ready to rip off the talis, rip off the twillin, and make him, force him to go right away. It was actually, unfortunately, the Nunju that said, let him finish, and then we'll go. And another thing the Free Rebbe points out, you'll see it here, that, that the Jewish person came from the city of Chevelle, and he actually once came to the Free Rebbe for assistance, and he arranged for him a position in a cigarette factory, and later he lent him money to establish his own business, and he built up a business for the next three years until the revolution. And this is the person that was ready to rip him apart. Very interesting. Anyway, going back to the story, he said that when he finished davening, they took him to the, their office, their headquarters. One of them on the right, one of them on the left, one behind them. And that was the way they used to arrest people that were accused of treason against the government, against the regime, the <coughs> communist regime. He walked into a room, in the room, there were 15 people sitting by a big table. One group on one side, one group on the other side. And there were two people sitting at the head of the table. And the free Rebbe was sitting at the foot of the table. And the three people were still next to him. One on the right, one on the left, one behind him. All the people in the room were armed with guns, with knives, with rifles, all the good things. And they said to him, we're members of the party's committee to investigate religious matters. And we already questioned certain other rabbis, and we had to question you. And they spoke to him in Russian. The whole group there were all Jews, unfortunately. The free Rebbe said, I answered them in Yiddish, because they all know Yiddish very well. And he said, I made it clear in two 
previous occasions when I was summoned to these headquarters that I will not budge for my principles. He didn't answer any questions. He just told them in advance. If you are coming, calling me here to make me change my principles or compromise, I will not budge for my principles. And he said, there is yet to be born and there never will be born, not a man or not a demon who will move me the slightest degree from any of my principles. Before he finished his words, the guy standing next to him picked up a, by the way, besides being armed from head to toe, they also had a gun on the table. Everyone had a revolver right in front of him. The guy next to him pulled the gun up, pointed at him, and said, this little toy takes care of principles. Fear opened a lot of mouths. I mean, even the mute start talking. So the Supreme Rebbe said, you're making a big mistake. This toy only impresses cowardly atheists who have one world and many gods. But for us, we have one single God and we believe in two worlds. Not only the toy doesn't frighten me, it makes no impression whatsoever. Try to say that in this kind of room with these kind of people with guns and knives and rifles intimidating you. And the Purim Rebbe just said it as it is. So this is sort of a, a model of what the Free of was all about and what he put up with. And yes, Baruch Hashem, we don't have such circumstances. But I think we could learn from that a little bit, how to stand up to some of the challenges we have, which is pretty much a joke compared to those challenges. I just many, said this many times, some of the Hasidim who sat in Russian jails for years when they came to America and they saw the challenges, they would say, these are the challenges of the American Chakaladnikis. <laughs> the Americans raised on chocolate bars. <laughs> So now I want to talk a little bit about the whole process of choosing the Rebbe and specifically how it came about that our Rebbe was chosen, what was going on. Now first let me give this introduction and that is, you know, when you're choosing someone to be a rabbi of a community, a rabbi must be somebody who is knowledgeable, has to be somebody who knows Torah. If you want him to be a rabbi, he also has to know halacha. And therefore, they would be interviewed by a committee of people who they themselves are great Hasidic, uh, not Hasidic, great Torah scholars. And they would interview this rabbi, discuss Torah matters with him to see if he's really a Torah scholar, a scholar that's suitable to be the one that should be the leader of their community, or he doesn't have the qualities to do that. Thank you. But the Rebbe, it doesn't work that way. You interview somebody, say, let me ask you a few questions to see if you could be a Rebbe. No, it doesn't work that way. Why? Because the Rebbe is not just an ordinary individual who is knowledgeable of Torah. A Rebbe is a person of a higher, much higher spiritual caliber, a tzaddik, somebody who's connected to higher spiritual things. And there aren't any people that could really uh, interview that and, and, and sort of figure that out. What do we know about these things? So therefore, the question begs on the other hand, so how can we ever choose someone as a Rebbe? If a Rebbe is somebody of higher spiritual uh, qualities, then who are the people that are knowledgeable to be able to recognize that and know that? So how do we choose a Rebbe? And it looks like the Rebbe that's chosen is usually the son of the previous Rebbe, the son in law of the previous Rebbe. And let's say in Chabad, as we'll soon see, the Rebbe is the son of the previous Rebbe. The previous Rebbe was the son of his father. His father was the son of his father. His father was the son of the previous Rebbe. That Rebbe was the son of the Alter Rebbe. So it looks like you keep it in the family. Is that, is that, this just doesn't sound right. So what a lot of people are not familiar with, if you look at the sheet that I just gave out, is that a Pasuk and Chumash. The Chumash talks about leadership. It's a Pasha Shoktim, which talks about kings, and this is the source for halachas uh, uh, that are relevant to leadership. And here it talks about who the king is. So look at Pasuk 20. And it says, first of all, you might as well read the whole thing. It says, it shall be with him. This is a mitzvah that a king has to have a Torah scroll. That's his private Torah scroll. He has to write a separate Torah scroll for himself. It should be with him. He should read it all the days of his life. So he may learn how to fear Hashem 
and to keep all the words of the Torah and the statutes to perform them so that his heart will not, not be haughty over his brothers and he will not turn away from the commandments either to the right or to the left. In other words, a king, no matter how great of a king he is, if he has to show them, deviates from Torah, then he is disqualified. So he has a Torah constantly to guide him. And then it says these words. And if he does the right thing, in order that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his sons among Israel. Look at Rashi on the bottom. This tells us, this is the source of this halacha, that if his son is worthy of becoming the king, he is given preference over any other person. Which means that it's not just we decide to do this because he belongs to the family, it's actually a commandment in the Torah. But when it comes to uh, choose a position of a king, and from this we derive, it applies to all positions of leadership, that if the son of this person is worthy of the position, he should be chosen before anyone else. And you go into the Gemara, the more details, the Gemara goes a step further, if not the son, it could be a son-in-law, and so on. So if he's not worthy, even if he's a son, he won't be appointed. For example, Moshe Rabbeinu, his son was not appointed to be his successor. Who was his successor? One of his students, Yeshua. And, and then there are cases where the son was. So one of the cases, which is an example, is um, yeah, the sheep, which you see here, this is uh, 15 generations of father and son and father and son and father and son, that they were all Nasi, they were all the leaders of Jewry in their generation. It started with Hillel, that was who's the most famous, he's known, and his son became the next Rebbe, and his son became the next Rebbe, and there was altogether 15 generations, only one generation for a period of time, there was someone else whose name was Rabbi Lozab and Nazaria. But other than that, 15 generations, one after the other, they were all the leaders. Why? Because they were worthy. And that's that's how we go by this. Now the question is, but if a Rebbe is someone who has Ruach HaKodesh, what do we do? We test him. We ask him to the, talk about the future. No, that's not what we do. We have to judge by what we can judge with our eyes. Because the Torah was given to humans, not to angels. So we just judge by our eyes. And if we see that this person studies Torah on a level which is exceptional, performs mitzvahs on a level which is exceptional, has character traits on a level which is exceptional, and basically does everything on a level where, it, to our eyes, it appears that he's above and beyond the average person and that he could be one of these tzaddikim, and this is the son of the one who passed away, or the son-in-law, then we assume that this is the person. Because again, the Torah was given to humans. And we don't have this vision to see what's going on on a higher plane. So obviously Hashem wants us to judge things the way humans can. And if we judge things the way humans can, the right way, then Hashem will make sure that we don't make any mistakes and we'll have the right person. So let's go into this a little bit in terms of how leadership starts. The first leader of the Jewish people was who? How did he get chosen? Hashem. Hashem himself chose him. He started the system. He saw him by the burning bush and he told him, I'm choosing you to be the leader of the Jewish people. And as we know, Moshe Rabbeinu immediately resisted. He didn't want the position because of his humility. And it says in the Medrash that for seven days, Hashem and Moshe were having a dialogue back and forth. Moshe refused and gave his reasons why not. And Hashem refused to accept his refusal and gave reasons why yes. And finally, at the end of the seven days, Hashem said, that's it, no more conversations. You are doing this, and, and, and that's final. That was Moshe Rabbeinu. And where do we know, where, how did Yeshua become the next leader after Moshe? Also, it's in the Chumash, where it says in the Torah, in Pasha Vayelech, and also in Pasha Pinchas, where Hashem tells Moshe, your student, Yeshua, will be the next leader after you. And Hashem tells Moshe that he should appoint him. But now, going to the, uh, uh, the Hasidic dynasty, so you have this sheet here which you have all the generations from the Hashem to until the Rebbe. So I want to go over briefly what happened before the Rebbe. How did it happen? The Hashem is the first. So the Hashem studied Torah with Achia Shiloni. 
Achia Shiloni was a Navi that lived hundreds of years, or more than hundreds, actually 2,000 years before the Baal Shem Tov. And he was the one that studied Torah with him, and he told him that he should take on a position of leadership. And the Baal Shem Tov was already a leader to a certain extent. There were a group of great Kabbalist mystics in the times of the Baal Shem Tov, that they were spreading the teachings of Kabbalah at that time, and he was the head of that group. They took him upon themselves. They appointed him as their head. And then came this time where he was told by the Achiyah to come out of the open, and his students accepted him as their head, and eventually he became the leader of Bnei Yisrael. After the Baal Shem Tov, who took over his position? I could follow what it says here. His son. He had a son. His name was Reb Tzvi, and he became the leader of the Hasidim. But it only lasted for one year. At the end of the year, it was actually on the day, the anniversary of the passing of the Baal Shemta, which is Shavuos. He announced that my father informed me that the leadership should be transferred from me to our colleague, Reb Dov Ber of Ms. Rich. So I'm going to ask him to stand up and go and sit in my seat and I'll sit in his seat and from now on he should be the leader of the Hasidim. Naturally, all the students of the Magid, Mazik Magid had 120 students which each one of them was very big tzaddik. They were the ones who later spread Hasidus. So when he said these words, they all stood up. They changed seats. He used to wear a special robe, which was a sign of leadership, and they switched the robes that they were wearing. And from that point on, the Mazir Chimagid became the leader of the Hasidim. What happened after the Mazir Chimagid's passing? After the Mazir Chimagid's passing, all the different students became rabbis in different places. So they began teaching, and their students, of course, accepted them as their leader. And the Alter Rebbe also began teaching Hasidus. And his students accepted him as their Rebbe. And that's how the Alt Rebbe came to be the leader of the first generation of Hasidim. When the Alt Rebbe passed away, the Alt Rebbe had three sons. It could have been any one of the three. Because a son, every one of them is qualified. But what happened was that the Alt Rebbe himself called in one of his uh, biggest Hasidim. And he gave him instructions that when the time will come, I'm letting you know that I want this son of mine to take over my position of leadership, which is the Mazir Chamagi. It wasn't so simple because there was another chassid at the time, also a very big chassid. His name was Rabaran Strasheller. And a lot of people wanted him to become a rebbe. They didn't know that the outer rebbe wanted this person to become rebbe. And apparently maybe they didn't even trust that he had that message. So a lot of them accepted that student, and he became a rebbe, actually. And there was a little split among the Alter Rebbe's Hasidim. One group went to him, and the other group went to the, the Mitzel Rebbe, which was the oldest son of the Alter Rebbe. And the other group, there was no continuity. After he passed away, there was no continuity. And Lubavitch today is a continuation of the Mitzel Rebbe. When the Mitzel Rebbe passed away, there were three options. One was the Mitzel Rebbe's son-in-law, who was Samach Tzedek, who actually became the future Rebbe. One option was the Mitzel Rebbe also had a son that was qualified, a big tzaddik. And the other option, the Mitzel Rebbe still had a brother, which was a son of the Alter Rebbe that was alive at the time. So when the Hasidim came to the Samach Tzedek and asked him to accept leadership, he said, why me? Go to my uncle. When they came to the uncle, he said, why me? Go to my nephew. When one nephew said, go to the other nephew. And basically the Hasidim were going from one to the other and nobody wanted to accept. After many months, a group of, of, of uh, Hasidim who were also Rabban and rabbis, and they were the prominent, most prominent of the Hasidim at that time. It was a few days before Shavuos. They approached the Tzemach Tzedek who was the son-in-law, and they said to him, one of them said to him, if anyone knows the family in Kronheis by the name of Chain, 
He's the father of that, the ancestor of that family. His name was Raperetz Chaim. And he said to him that I have proof from a Mishnah that you have to be taken on the leadership. So Machzadik said, okay, I'm not going to argue with the Mishnah. Where's, which Mishnah do you have that I have to take the leadership? He told me there's a Mishnah that says that when a baby boy is born, it's more connected to the mother. The baby girl is born, it's more connected to the father, biologically, which also means spiritually. So therefore, your mother is the most connected to the altar ever because she was a girl, a woman. And if that's the case, you are the most connected to your mother because your boy is most connected to the mother. So in a way, you have a more direct connection to the altar ever than the others. And for whatever reason, the Tzamech Tzedek accepted his words and he accepted to become the next Rebbe. And he said a mimer, and that's how his leadership began. When the Tzamech Tzedek was nostalgic, when the Tzamech Tzedek passed, Tzamech Tzedek had five sons. Again, each one of them was a Tzedek. Each one was righteous. I see a hand. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Did they, was it that like the others didn't, like, didn't want to be the Rebbe or they had like the real Kaidish to know that they weren't the Rebbe or that they just had understanding that they weren't the Rebbe? Like, how did they, what does that mean that they just didn't, like, they. When they all refused. Yeah, but. Well, we see even the one who was meant to be Rebbe also refused. Why is that? So we're going to try to get to that when we talk about our Rebbe. Who okay. also refused. Okay. Yeah, try to get to that and explain it. Another question. Yeah. <laughs> so wasn't it the Mitzvah Rebbe where um, his mom, like, Davin, that she should pass away and said the altar Rebbe so that he be raised? No, that was the, that was the Tzemach Tzedek's mom. Oh, and okay. she was a daughter of the altar Rebbe, right? Okay. She was the one that gave up her life for the altar of yeah, okay. So did, did um Harris claim like bring us up when he was talking to him about it? It doesn't say that. The the history that I read doesn't bring that up, but it could be other people brought it up and it still didn't do the job. He just brought up the fact that you are a son to your mother and she's a daughter to her father, and therefore you have the most direct connection. That was his point. I think it does say the Alter Rebbe, the Tzemastatic also had a dream, either the night before or within that time. And he had a dream where the Alter Rebbe said to him the same thing. And then when he heard it from them, he felt that this is coming from a higher place and he took it on. Tzemastatic had five sons. And, and, and the Rebbe Marash, who became the Rebbe, was actually the youngest of all the sons. He was the youngest. And uh, when this happened, oh, that's really when there was a big split in Chabad, which means a lot of the Hasidim went to the oldest son. Some of the Hasidim went to the other. There were, uh, there were already three sons that became rabbis in different cities. One was a rabbi in a city called Avruch. One is a rabbi in a city called Ladi. One was a rabbi in a city called Kapus. And in the city of Lubavitch, there were two sons. One was the oldest and one was the youngest. Both of them did not become rabbis. But the Tzemach Tzedek also left a message, a note, that the, Tzemach, the Rebbe Maharaj, the youngest son, should become the next Rebbe. At least he should be the Rebbe in Lubavitch. So they remained Rebbes in their city, but in Lubavitch he became the Rebbe. And there were still a lot of questions. Maybe people didn't know about the note or they didn't trust the note. I'm not sure what happened then. But I do know, and I heard this one of the older Hasidim, that he said that it's known Tzemach Tzedek was nostalgic before Pesach. Rosh Hashanah is seven months later. That Rosh Hashanah, there was hardly a minion in the Rebbe Shul. Where was everybody? By all the other sons. He had the least because he was the youngest. So basically, initially, people didn't realize. Eventually, all the other branches discontinued. And when the Babich is today, it's only from the youngest son, the Rebbe Marash. Just to give one example, there was one chassid, he was considered one of the greatest chassidim of the Rebbe Marash. And by the way, the Rebbe Marash was known that he did things in a very humorous way. And by doing that, he was able to camouflage and hide his greatness a lot. So he, on the surface, looked like not such a big chassid, such a great tzaddik like his other brothers. So that's why a lot of people didn't think that he was really the one that should be leading. But there was one chassid who was actually one of the biggest chassidim, his name was Gershom Ber, and he said 
I'm going to this son, to the youngest, which probably led a lot of other people to do the same. And he told a story that one time the Tzemach Tzedek said a minor, and he was thinking in his head what the Tzemach Tzedek just said is in direct contradiction to what it says in Eitz Chaim, which is the writings of the Arizo. How could it be? And he looked at it and looked at it and looked at it. He couldn't find an answer. He himself was brilliant. And he knew Hasidus and Kabbalah, and he couldn't find an answer. So he went to the oldest son of the Tzemach Tzedek to ask him what he thinks. They spent a lot of time thinking about it. No answer. He went to the next son. He went to the next son. He couldn't. This is a person that to him, this was like anything else that we would do that when it comes to Gashmi. It does not let up until I get this clear. I can't go to sleep. Finally, without an answer, he decided he's going home. What about the youngest son? So he figured if they don't know the answer, he surely doesn't know the answer. So he went home. On the way going home, this is like three in the morning, he sees the light in the Rebbe Manasha's house is on. So he decides, let me see, let me, let, me, let me take a look. He goes over to the door and he sees the Rebbe Maharaj sitting by the table. And what does he have on the table? The Eitz Chaim. And it's on that page where the question is. Oh, obviously he has the same question as me. So he knocks on the door. Who's there? Tells him who he is. Says, uh, just wait a few minutes. So he waits a few minutes. He opens the door. The Eitz Chaim is gone. Instead of Eitz Chaim, there are newspapers on the table. So he says, yeah, what happened? Why are you here at 3 o'clock in the morning? He says, I have a question from the Mimer. It's contradicting to what it says in the Eitz Chaim. He says, come on, you're going to come to me at 3 o'clock in the morning with such a question? And he was an older chassid, much older than Rabbi Marash. He said, listen, either you're going to sit down and tell me what you think about it, otherwise I'll tell the whole town what I just saw two minutes ago. He said, okay, calm down, sit down. He said he sat down. He gave me such a brilliant, deep explanation that I saw this son is hiding something more than all the other sons. And that's when I made a decision that this is where I'm going. He knew that Rabbi Marash was not what he appeared to be on the surface. So he became a chassid the Rebbe Marash. And then from there, uh, others started to also follow. And eventually that became the biggest, strongest uh, branch in the Babich. What was that chassid's name? Who? The one who I think I think his name was Gershon Bear. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, Mrs. Jacobson was the, the teacher in the school. Her husband, who had the same name, Gershon Bear, was a great grandchild of this chassid. Wow. You can ask her about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what happened after the Rebbe Marash, who was the youngest? The Rebbe Marash, Marash had three sons. This was the most difficult time in all the Chabad history. The three sons. So the, the one of them was much younger, and there wasn't really the main option. The option was the two older sons. The oldest son was not the Rebbe Rashab. His brother was older than him. His name was Rabbi Zalman Aaron. And the Rebbe Rashab said, go to my older brother. When they came to the older brother, he said, go to my younger brother. But this went on for 10 years. It wasn't like the others, a few months, but it's actually 10 years. And for these 10 years, slowly but surely, people stopped coming to Lubavitch Zaman to come for. The Rebbe is not saying, no one's saying a mimer. The Rebbe is not accepting people to private audience to give them advice and guidance. Everything was sort of stopped. The Freedic Rebbe uses a term, he said, these 10 years were the 10 years, he used the term of the Churban Lubavitch. Like the city of Lubavitch was relatively like a ghost town. Nobody came. What happened eventually, and this is important to know for the explanation, a group of all the Hasidim got together and they said, you know, this we can't go on like this anymore. Things are falling apart. They made a meeting and they said, each one of these old Hasidim, these were Hasidim from the times of the Rebbe Marash, Tzemach Tzedek, everyone respected them. But they made up, they're each going to travel to different places in Russia, to different Chabad communities, and encourage everybody to come for Tishrei, and to let the Rebbe know that we want him to accept leadership. And that's what happened. So that year, first time in 10 years, there were 600 people that came for Rosh Hashanah, which those numbers were bigger uh, than anything else in the last 10 years, not the numbers we have today. And strange enough, the Rabbi Rashab heard that 600 people came. He came out and said a mimer. 
He didn't accept fully leadership until a year later, but that's when things started to move, and eventually he accepted the leadership. By the way, how old was he when his father passed away? He was 22 years old, very young. But by Rebbe, age is not really the issue. The young, the old, we're talking about people of a higher spiritual caliber. And again, to give an example of what I mean, is that the Rebbe Rashab was, when he was this age, sitting by the table with a group of Hasidim and discussing something. And there was a, a Hasid there who was older than the Rebbe Rashab, from the older Hasidim. And he told the Rebbe Rashab, apparently he disagreed with something that the Rebbe Rashab said. And, or maybe this was, or this was maybe after he accepted leadership. Even after accepting, he was 32 years old, still very young. So he told the Rebbe Rashab, sometimes an old soldier can give advice to a young general. Meaning you're a general, but you're young. I'm a soldier, only a soldier, but I'm an old soldier. So an old soldier can sometimes give advice to a young general. So the Rebbe Rashab answered him in Yiddish, of course. He said, you know what? A, um, a young man in the, in the Tsar's family can do. It was a metaphoric way of saying somebody young, but in the family of the Rebbe's, as if not, it's not about me, it's because I'm in the family of the Rebbe's. He can tell you every thought that passed your mind since the day you were born. And the chassid was taken aback and stopped. Basically, it meant to say, listen, we're, don't compare. We're in a diff two different places. We're not at the same place at all. It's a whole different, a whole different story when we're talking about what is a Rebbe and what is a Chassid. A Rebbe is not just a very smart Chassid, a very accomplished Chassid, a very uh, spiritual Chassid. A Rebbe is a different caliber completely. When the Rebbe Rashab was nostalgic, that was in 1920, there really wasn't any issue because he only had one son, and that one son was the Friedrich Rebbe. By the way, the Rebbe once spoke about the Rebbe Rashab and said, that apparently the reason why the Rebbe Rashab didn't want to accept leadership mainly was because his older brother, he didn't want to accept leadership in the presence of his older brother. And it could be the older brother realized that and he moved away from the city of Lubavitch to another city. After he moved away, then the Rebbe Rashab accepted leadership, which is similar to what happened with Moshe, by the way. If you learn the Chumash, why didn't Moshe want to accept leadership? He said to Hashem, I have an older brother, Aaron, he should be the one that has the leadership. Anyway, the Friedrich Rebbe, that was, uh, that was, uh, he was the only son. There were no daughters, no other sons, one single child. And that was the Friedrich Rebbe, so that was not an issue. And he immediately took on the position of leadership. When the Friedrich Rebbe was nostalgic, this is 1950, the Friedrich Rebbe had three son-in-laws. Friedrich Rebbe only had daughters, three daughters. One daughter was Rebbe Tzachayim Mushka, one daughter was Chana, and one daughter was Shengel. Unfortunately, the daughter was called Shengel and her husband, they were both murdered by the Nazis. And the Rebbe and the Rebbetzin, as you probably know the story, they were almost there, they were in France when the Nazis came in and miraculously their lives were saved. The third daughter, which is Chana, who married somebody called Shmayor Gurari, they were traveling with the Friedrich Rebbe out of Europe to America, so they were here all the time. So the other son-in-law was older than the Rebbe. The Rebbe was younger, and therefore when the time came for leadership, there were two possibilities. The two possibilities were either the Rebbe or the other son-in-law, that was the only one who they could think of. So there was some who wanted this son-in-law, and some wanted that son-in-law. And each one, each group sort of had their reasons and why they're based, what they're basing it on. But the majority of Hasidim felt that it should be the Rebbe. And there were also a group of people who thought it should be the other son-in-law. One of the reasons why they thought it should be the other son-in-law was before the previous Rebbe became Rebbe, his father, the Rebbe Rashab, appointed him to be in charge and be the director of all the yeshivas of Tamchitvim. All the Chabad yeshivas were under his leadership. 
the free the grabber appointed this son-in-law to have the same position that all the Lubavitch yeshiva should be under his leadership. So people felt that that might be some sort of a sign that he should be the one to lead. On the other hand, the Rebbe did things which are very unusual. The Rebbe was the most private secretary of the Friedrich Rebbe. But in addition to that, when the Friedrich Rebbe gave out a mimer, the Rebbe would publish the mimer, and in the mimer that he published, he would add his commentary to the mimer of the Friedrich Rebbe. Generally speaking, nobody adds commentary to a mimer of a Rebbe. You can write it in your own book, but not you don't publish a mimer of a Rebbe with your commentary. But of course, it was done with the consent of the previous Rebbe. The only other person who did the same thing was the Tzemach Tzedek, who was the son-in-law of his, the previous Rebbe, a, a, a son-in-law of the Alter Rebbe, and he also published the Alter Rebbe's Maimarim with his commentary. And by the way, a lot of similarities, the same name, the Rebbe says the same name, there were only two who were son-in-laws. But someone said, like, before the Rebbe became Rebbe, you know, Hasidim didn't look at, didn't, some of them didn't realize the Rebbe was who he was, because the Rebbe was also very, like the Rebbe Marash, the Rebbe was very hidden. He wore a short jacket. He sometimes would wear gloves, gray gloves. He worked in the Navy Yard. People, he was in charge of everything going on. He was the free to grab his right hand person to do everything and run all the institutions. But nobody really knew the Rebbe sort of played everything down very much. Nobody knew who the Rebbe really was, except for those who were closer to him. And it took time even then. But this is one of the strong things that the fact that he was given a position and given consent by the previous Rebbe to actually add points in his mimer means that there's something more there than just a secretary. That was one of the things. And there were other things that, that they brought in. But when they came to the Rebbe, he said, it's not me. And it was going you know, back and forth. And someone to this, someone to that. But like I said, the majority of Hasidim saw clearly that it's the Rebbe. And I'm going to go through a little bit of the history of what happened. This book, by the way, this is what the Rebbe looked like at the time that it became Rebbe. The Rebbe was 48 years old then. And this book, it's called Yemei Breshis, which means the whole book is about the first year. What happened, how the, how the process took place that the Rebbe should accept leadership. And basically what was going on was that people, and this is just like in the past, Hasidim come to the Rebbe and they ask, and tell the Rebbe that we want you to accept the position of leadership. And, and eventually the Rebbe's would accept. So here they did that, the same thing. They came to the Rebbe and they said, we want you to accept leadership. Who's, who's the they? Not the kids, and not the young people, mainly the older Hasidim. They came to the Rebbe to accept leadership. But whoever came to the Rebbe, the Rebbe refused. And he said, it's, it's not me. It's not, uh, I'm not the one who should be in this place. So actually, we find one of the people who were very active, and he was the first one to approach the Rebbe, is actually Rabbi Dubov's great-grandfather, the one who teaches here. His great-grandfather lived in England, and he happened to be here at the time, because I think Rabbi Dubov's grandfather was getting married, so he was here. And he was the first one to approach the Rebbe to accept leadership. And the Rebbe said, and he walked over to the Rebbe within a few days after Yitzvat, and he said to the Rebbe that Hasidim won the Rebbe to accept the leadership. And the Rebbe answered him very sternly, the Rebbe is alive. Don't talk to me like that. So he said, all the Rebbe's said they can continue to live, but we still choose another Rebbe. He said, well, it's not me. And that was that. And the Rebbe was very strong, so he didn't even push any further. But nevertheless, when he went back to England, he gathered together all the Hasidim that he had there. And they all signed a document. When the document, they write that we're accepting the Rebbe's leadership and we want to submit ourselves to be students of the Rebbe and Hasidim of the Rebbe and we want the Rebbe to, to lead us. But he was the first person ever to approach. Another thing, let's not remember that the Rebbe, before he became Rebbe, was just one of the Hasidim. Nobody sort of... Uh, looked at him as a Rebbe. So people would meet him, say hello, talk to him. And of course, when you meet someone, you shake your hand. 
once people wanted the Rebbe to accept leadership, I don't know, by the way, if you know this, but in Chabad, we don't shake the Rebbe's hand. In other circles, they do. In fact, it's one of the ways of the Rebbe giving a bracha is by a handshake. In Chabad, we don't shake the Rebbe's hand. And I don't know the reason why there's a difference, but the reason why we don't do it is because it's something too casual. And a Rebbe, someone who's a tzaddik, is supposed to be standing at a distance in awe and not doing something which could make it more casual. So the Hasidim didn't give the Rebbe the handshake anymore. He would walk into 770, say hello, and the person would go like that. Sometimes the Rebbe would just hold his hand, and, and, and then the other person was so embarrassed, he finally said, gave his hand. But people wrote that, how some of them gave in, and some of them just wouldn't give the hand. So the Rebbe just smiled and let go. But they tell a cute story that there are, someone writes that he was in the Rebbe's room with his family, and he had a little, a little boy there, and the Rebbe stuck out his hand to the little boy. But you know little kids, they get shy, they start moving their shoulders up and down, and he wouldn't <laughs> shake the hand. And the Rebbe goes, oh no, he's also not giving me a handshake, you know. <laughs> the kid. So the Rebbe was very aware of what was going on with the chassidim. The, uh, another interesting thing was, like I said, the Rebbe presented himself as if he was somebody, uh, a regular person. And the Rebbe wore, uh, like I said, a gray hat, not a black hat during the week. Shabbos, he wore a black hat. Shabbos, he wore a kapata. But during the week, he wore a short jacket. In any other circles, a person who's the son of, of the Rebbe would wear a longer jacket. That's usually for someone who is... It doesn't mean a Rebbe, but anyone who was the head of a yeshiva in one way or another, so it would be suitable, but the Rebbe wore a short jacket. Being that the passing of the priest Rebbe was on Shabbos, so naturally the Rebbe wore the black hat and the long jacket all week. But then even after the week was over, the Rebbe continued to wear it. So the Hasidim, that gave them a little bit of a hint that looks like the Rebbe is accepting. However, when the Shloshim was over, we know that the first 30 days is a special period of mourning. After the first 30 days, the Rebbe went back to putting on the short jacket, but he still kept the black hat. So what that means, I don't know, but I'll explain something that might, might help understand what was going on. In the meantime, yes? If all the Hasidim are having like kind of like Ruach HaKodesh or a little minor form of that to know that the Rebbe is going to be the Rebbe, so then how come he is the, he's the leader, he's the biggest of all the, he doesn't have that same like name to know that he actually is going to be the Rebbe. I'm leading up to that. I'm going to explain that. Yeah, I'm going to explain that. And I'm going to make sure to get, before the clock gets to me, I'll get to it. <laughs> so this is what was happening around the world, that there were Hasidim from Paris, France, Hasidim in Montreal, Hasidim in England, Hasidim in Israel, of course, all got together. And every group wrote a note when they wrote the same content, because this was done in previous generations as well. And they just followed. They wrote a note which called Ksav Hiskashus, a note of dedication, of connection, that were writing to the Rebbe that ready to accept. And uh, there were certain people who were older Hasidim that they approached the Rebbe privately. And they said what's on their mind and what's on their heart to try to convince the Rebbe, because like I told you in the previous generations, that's very often what happened, the older chassid, who the Rebbe respected and looked up to, said something which had an impact. So one such story is with a chassid who is called Rabbi Ashkenazi. He was a very big rav. In fact, his grandson for many years was the head rabbi in Israel amongst Chabad. He was the rabbi of Kfar Chabad. But he himself was a rabbi in Shanghai, and then later he was in Israel. So he told the Rebbe that he, that he has a sikh of the Friedrich Rebbe, where he tells the following story. That when the Tzamech Tzedek became Rebbe, there was still Hasidim of the grandfather, the Alter Rebbe, and the Hasidim of the Mittel Rebbe. They knew the Tzamech Tzedek since he was a young child. So for some of them, it wasn't, wasn't easy to take on the Tzamech Tzedek as the Rebbe. This Hasid, his name is Rebbe Nechemya, wasn't just a big Hasid. He actually wrote parts which were added to the Alter Rebbe Shulchan Aruch. So he was on a very high level. And actually, he did not come to be a chassid of the Tzemach Tzedek. He didn't join the other chassidim. Again, not chassid that he didn't think that it's not the great rebbe, 
but he just didn't have it in him anymore. So he was a chassid of one rebbe, a chassid of another rebbe. Like sometimes chassidim express themselves that I gave my whole essence to the rebbe. I connected them on the deepest core level. I can't, you know, it's like, like sometimes some, a woman is married to someone after they pass away, they remarry. And sometimes they just don't have it in themselves. They felt the connection to the first person was so strong that they just can't have that kind of relationship with anyone else. And that's the way the chassid felt. Anyway, a group of his friends <coughs> were in the city of Lubavitch for Yontif. And on the way home, they stopped off in his house. He lived very close to Lubavitch. And he told them, next week, I'm going to Lubavitch for the first time. I said, really? What happened? He said, I had a dream. The Alter Rebbe came to me in a dream. and said, why don't you have a Rebbe? So I said to the Alter Rebbe, actually, who should I go to? So the Alter Rebbe said to him, explained to him, that uh, the difference between the name Noyach and the name Menachem. So Noyach and Menachem have the same letters, Nun Ches, but in Menachem there's a Mem before and a Mem after. He explained it according to Kabbalah, what the difference is. And, and it basically he concluded by saying, there's a word in Chumash, Ze Yenachemenu. This person will bring us comfort, referring to the name Menachem. So he understood it means this person, his name is Menachem, that was the name of the Tzamat Tzedek, he will bring his comfort. But he said these words, he will bring his comfort now, and he will bring his comfort in the future. So he said to the Rebbe, obviously that's referring to you. You have the same name as the Tzamat Tzedek, that you will bring his comfort now. So this is an indication that the Rebbe should accept leadership. The Rebbe heard what he said, but he didn't respond. Didn't, didn't say anything, didn't respond, I didn't accept. One of the things that I've also said to people was when they said that he should accept, he said, I never heard anything like that from my father-in-law. So a minion, ten chassidim, went to the oil of the pre Rebbe, and he said that the Rebbe refuses to accept leadership because he said that he never heard it from you. Could you please take care? And that was sort of their request. And even though the Rebbe didn't accept, but they never again after that heard the Rebbe say, I never heard anything from my father-in-law, whatever that means. There was one person who lived in England who thought that he was just going to jump ahead. And what he did was he printed stationery of his institution, and he wrote it's under the leadership of the Lubavitcher Rebbe Shlita, and he wrote the Rebbe's name. And he sent it to the Rebbe for what he did. He got a telegram that he should immediately burn every piece of stationery and never do this again without, do anything like that without my consent. So he had no choice. He had to burn stationery. The Rebbe would not allow anyone to refer to him as, as the Rebbe. Not only that, but uh, the Rebbe would have for brains. Why would he have for brains if he didn't accept leadership? Because the previous Rebbe requested that every Shabbos Mavorchim, he should have a for brains even during the lifetime of the previous Rebbe. So he would have a Fabrengen. And when the Rebbe had the Fabrengen, before people would just sit down, listen to Fabrengen. But now that they're looking at the Rebbe as the new Rebbe, the, uh, someone is the Rebbe. His name was Rabbi Yael Khan. He was the one who became the Chazer. He was the one who wrote up all the Rebbe's Sikhs in the future. By the way, it's an interesting story with him. He lived in Israel. And he asked the previous Rebbe if he should come to learn to America. And the previous Rebbe said, yes. So he came to America. But when he was on the boat, that's when your tried happened. When he came to America, when he arrived in America a few days later, the previous Rebbe was already not here. So he didn't know what he should do. And people were asking the Rebbe advice. He walked over to the Rebbe and he asked the Rebbe, what do you think I should do? He told me to come. And now it's after Yitzvah, should I stay? Should I go back? And the Rebbe said, listen, the Friedrich Rebbe knew what's going to happen. Nevertheless, he told you to come, so probably you should stay. And of course, he became the person. He was brilliant. His memory was phenomenal. He was the person that on Shabbos or Yonta, when the Rebbe spoke, he remembered everything, and then he would review it and put it out on paper. And he, he was the one to publicize all the Rebbe's talks. He was a bachar at the time, but he came to the Rebbe and asked the Rebbe, is it okay if I write up what you for brain and publicize it? 
Reb said, yeah, you can do that. That's not a, in other words, that doesn't mean I did it, I'm changing. And that's what he did. When he handed it into the Rebbe to sort of edit, he wrote on top the sikhs of the Rebbe Shlita. The Rebbe took a pen, crossed it off, like this doesn't go, and wouldn't allow that to happen. And by the way, sikhs, everyone could talk. Sikh means a discussion, a talk. But a mimer, a mimer Hasidic, a Hasidic discourse, that's something which is said only by, by a Rebbe. So one of the first things that sort of broke the ice and people felt some indication that the Rebbe is perhaps accepting was on Lagba Omer, a few months later. Lagba Omer, everybody went to the Ohel. And instead of taking their notes themselves, the Rebbe went with everybody on a school bus. Everybody went together. So they gave the Rebbe the note that he should read it for them. And the Rebbe accepted it. The fact that the Rebbe accepted their pan to them was a sign the Rebbe could have said, read it yourself. I have to read it for you. The fact that he accepted it was a sign that something is moving, but still the Rebbe refused to uh, do that. Another thing, when people came to ask the Rebbe advice, guidance about Gashmias, or guidance about spirituality, the Rebbe said, go to the oil and ask my father-in-law. So they said, yeah, I can ask him, but I'm not going to get an answer. So the Rebbe said, if you go and you put in your notes, the Rebbe will find a way how to answer you. And to some people he said, you'll see whatever thought comes to your mind, the first thing, that's probably going to be what... And they would say, no, I need someone I can talk to. I have to hear an answer. But the Rebbe refused to go to my father-in-law. There were certain people who were persistent. They wouldn't walk out of the room and say to the Rebbe, please, I'm begging you, give me advice. And when that happened, sometimes the Rebbe would accept. In fact, the Rebbe was sitting in his room without a hat, without a jacket sometimes, casually. And then when a the person did that, the Rebbe would put on his hat, put on his jacket, put on his gartel, and answer them. Which means by them asking and persisting, something happened. So one of those people was this person, Rabbi Ashkenazi, that I mentioned before. He lived in Tel Aviv. And at the time, there was a very big tzaddik that came and it was saved by the Holocaust. It was named the Belzer Rebbe. Right now, there's a big group in Israel called Bells. He was a very big tzaddik. And because he just came and had a needed place to live, he lived in their house. And this person had a few conditions uh, with his eyes. He had some problems, and he gave him a bracha, and it was healed. And then he said to him one time, listen, I'm not your rebbe, but I'm going to give you three pieces of advice. He told him three things. One of them was, don't go to the gravesite of tzaddikim. So when he came to the Rebbe, he asked this question. The Rebbe said, go to the oil. He said, I have a great tzaddik. The Belzer Rebbe told me not to go to the great side of tzaddikim. So the Rebbe said, first the Rebbe refused, then the Rebbe said, I guess you have no choice. In fact, he told you, I'm not your Rebbe, but still I'm telling you to do this. Okay, so the Rebbe gave him an answer. This is one person, another person came to a point where after a while, the Rebbe became more open to give people advice about Gashmis and Ruchmias. So people started to come to, but it was different than that. You just knocked on the door and you just walked in and you had an answer to your question. Another thing, which was the thing that, that uh, was, a, was a big thing, was Chai Elul. Chai Elul, the Rebbe wrote a letter in honor of Rosh Hashanah, but it was addressed. To whom was it addressed? to every single man and woman around the world. Who addresses every man and woman around the world? I mean, I write a letter to a friend. I can write a letter to my students. The Rebbe wrote to every Jew around the world. Again, to Chassidim, they felt that, oh, it looks like the Rebbe is accepting. But then they tried again. The Rebbe should say a mimer. He said, no way, I'm not saying any mimer. By the way, they said to the Rebbe, maybe you can just review a mimer of the Friedrich Rebbe. So there's no, no change. It's not even that. It was a, a chassid of the Friedrich Rebbe, who was also the, um, he was the secretary of the Friedrich Rebbe. His name was Rabbi Simpson. Some of you might know the family in Crown Heights. This is the grandfather, a great grandfather, depends who you know. And he told the Rebbe, it was a very prominent chassid, and he told the Rebbe that I had a dream. In the dream, I was sitting by Fabrengen with the previous Rebbe, with your father-in-law, and there were a lot of other chassidim there. And the Friedrich Rebbe took, looked at me and said, why do you look so down? 
So I said to the Pridik Rebbe, you know why? Basically, because you're not here. So the Pridik Rebbe said to him, but I left you my son-in-law, and he said the Rebbe's name. So he said to the Pridik Rebbe, but he doesn't want to accept. So he said, go call him, and I'll speak to him. And he had this dream two or three times. Apparently he woke up and had a dream again and again. So I went to call you, he said. When I went to call you, I woke up. And that's it. I, I couldn't have that. Then the dream didn't end. The free the free rebbe said, "I want to, you know, endorse him." So the rebbe said to him, "Probably you thought about it by day, so you dreamt about it at night. Doesn't mean anything." So he told the rebbe, "Actually, I didn't think about this all day." The rebbe didn't make light of it. The rebbe just said, "Well, I don't feel anything," and this is part of the answer. The rebbe saying, "I don't feel that this is something that I have the thing to do." In fact, in one of the answers the Rebbe wrote people was, whatever I have, whatever I possess, I'm ready to give. What I don't have, I can't give, and I'm not allowed to say that I'm giving because I don't have it. So I'm basically, I'm not the person in this position, which is a Rebbe. And basically, I would say that by the time Rosh Hashanah came, the Rebbe was meeting with people three nights a week. It became so accepted. Sunday night, Tuesday night, and Thursday night. But no matter what was tried, Rosh Hashanah, for this day, the Rebbe did not accept leadership. But then another thing happened, which is also another movement forward, which means I'm showing you that there was a gradual process of the Rebbe some ways accepting and some ways not. When, how do you call up a Rebbe to the Torah? Every person, you call them up by their name and their father's name. He would say, Rebbe Yaakov, the son of Moshe, whatever the person's name is. But Rebbe, because we don't, it's not respectful to say the Rebbe's name. So the Gabbai, he calls him to the Torah, we just say, Yamod Adonenu Moreinu Rabbeinu, the son of so-and-so. So when they tried that with the Rebbe, he refused to, uh, to respond. So they had no choice that he called the Rebbe by his name. Simchas Torah, when they called up the Rebbe to the Torah, whoever was the Gabbai, maybe he said L'chaim before, but he was in a little bit of an uplifted spirit. And he said out loud, Yamod Adonenu Moreinu Berabeinu Ben Harav Rav Levi Yitzchok. The Rebbe walked over to the Torah as if it was just norm. But from that point on, he walked over to the Torah when they called him that title. So that was again something that showed the Rebbe is accepting. So when they saw that, would the Rebbe say Maimer? No, Maimer, no. <laughs> so there was, there was a little bit of, like you would call it in today's language, mixed messages. <laughs> the next thing that happened, which was big, was as it was getting closer to Yutchvat, it was Chavdala Teva, the yard side of the Alter Rebbe. Some Hasidim, the older Hasidim, got together and they put an ad in the newspaper. And they said, in a few weeks from now, it would be Yud Shvat, which is the day of passing of the Friedrich Rebbe. There'll be a big Fabrengen in 770. And the Rebbe's son-in-law will be appointed as a new Rebbe. The Rebbe called him in and said, I, no, the Rebbe called his secretary in and he told him, I want you to put a disclaimer in the newspaper that I never agreed to this. He started to panic and he called these older Hasidim. So they went into the Rebbe and they were asking the Rebbe not to do it and the Hasidim want this and we wanted to finally begin the day of the yard side, back and forth, back and forth. Finally, one of the older Hasidim said to the Rebbe, by the way, it doesn't say that you're accepting. It says that we're accepting you. You can't put a disclaimer on that. <laughs> anyway, he walked out and that's what happened. They put in this article. It was uh, three weeks before you Yudshvat. And shortly after that, another group of people, Rabbanim and all the Hasidim, came into the Rebbe, and they handed the Rebbe a note with accepting leadership. They gave the note to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe said, what, what do you want? So they said, read what we wrote. The Rebbe read the first line, and the Rebbe broke down crying and said, this is not, it has nothing to do with me. Please leave the room. They all had to leave. So they're still, they're still not there. <laughs> this is going on. And actually... Even the day of Yud Shvat, a, a, a group of people walked over to the Rebbe, and this chassid I mentioned before, Rabbi Ashkenazi, said to the Rebbe that 
The Rebbe's accepting leadership will enhance all the activities of spreading Hasidus in the world. And spreading Hasidus brings Mashiach. So the Rebbe's accepting leadership will hasten Mashiach's coming. You have to do this. At this point, the Rebbe said, but I need help. So that was the first time the Rebbe responded in a positive way. That day, Yud Shvah, the Rebbe went to the Oihel. It was a big for bringing the 770, and everybody is like anticipating, like, what's going to happen? Will the Rebbe yes accept, not accept? The Rebbe started for Bregan, and all of a sudden, one of the old Hasidim, his name was Rabbi Nemtsov, I think he was also from England, he got up and he said to the Rebbe, Rebbe, the Sikhs are wonderful, but we Hasidim want to hear a mimer. The Rebbe didn't respond. A little while later, some people write the exact time, it was 10.40, the Rebbe said, first he spoke that he was giving a sicha, that the free Rebbe wrote a mimer, which is Bossi Lagani, and he had the book open in front of him. And then he started to say, it with the, that when a Rebbe says a mimer, what, what makes us recognize that it's a mimer? Maybe he's just explaining something. A mimer was said, first of all, with a special tune, special niggin. Second of all, the Rebbe, when they said a mimer, would put a kerchief, a certain handkerchief around their hand, hold on to a piece of cloth. This is from the Alter Rebbe and all the Rebbe's of Chabad. And also with the eyes closed, not like a sicha. And that's how the Rebbe started to say Basulagani. And then the Rebbe started to give his own insight, new insight into the Maimur. And everybody realized that this is, the Rebbe is accepting leadership. He said a few minutes of the Maimur, then he stopped. When he stopped, this older chassid Nemtsev jumped up on a table and he said, Baruch Hashem, we have a Rebbe. And he made a bracha, Baruch Hashem, with Abish's name, of course. Shechiyonu, v'kimonu, v'giyonu, v'zman hazeh. And all the chassidim answered a big amen. The Rebbe smiled at him and told him to go off the table. <laughs> and, continued his and then the Rebbe said that it's, it's, it's customary in this country when something new starts, that you make a statement. So the Rebbe says he's going to make a statement. And the statement is that there are three things, three kinds of love, they all go together. Abbas Yisrael, love for a fellow Jew. Abbas Torah, love for Torah. And Abbas Hashem, love for Hashem. And these three things are not separate, they're all one. If you truly have love for Hashem, then you should have love for Torah and love for every Jew. And if you truly, and if you have love for Hashem and for Torah, not for love for a fellow Jew, then apparently your love for Hashem and your love for Torah is not the real thing. And that was the Rebbe's sort of uh, beginning first statement. At that time, he also requested to sing the Nigan of every one of the Rabbeim. And the Rebbe also said that people shouldn't think that I'm going to be doing all the work for everybody. Life, life is not going to be so easy. I'm going to give you work to do. I'm going to work, but I need you to work along with me. And uh, that was the beginning. That's how it all started. That's how the Rebbe accepted leadership. But the Rebbe continued, as someone brought up yesterday, continued to say the free the Rebbe was the Nasi of our generation because the Rebbe, in his humility, always referred to the free the Rebbe that he continues to be the Rebbe. He's leading. He's giving us the power to do everything. I'm just the hands and feet that through him. So now, just to give a little explanation, what is this all about? What, what's, uh, why, is it, why do they refuse? And if they do refuse, why do they accept? In fact, they're very sharp letters. I didn't go into all this. Some sample are very sharp. How, how do you even think of offering me such a thing? Do you know what it means to be a Rebbe? My grandfather was one of the older Siddim at that time. He was the Chassid of the Rebbe Rashab, Chassid of the Pridic Rebbe. And he also wrote a, Rebbe, a letter to the Rebbe. The Rebbe wrote him back, very sharp response. Like, uh, how do you even think you have, you know what a Rebbe is? And he goes on describing and saying, and how do you offer that to me? But what's really going on is like this. There is an explanation of Hasidus, mainly in the Maimarim of Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the time that we accept Hashem's sovereignty. We crown Hashem as the king. That's the coronation. So in those Maimarim, from every single Rebbe of Chabad, the Alt Rebbe, the Mitt Rebbe, Tzemach Tzedek, the Mitt Rebbe has a whole safer on this called the Teres Reish, all about this subject. That what happens when we accept a king as a king? 
And of course, it's very deep and there are a lot of explanations, but the general gist of it is that kingdom, a person who is destined to have a position of leadership, especially if it's a king, that means Hashem gave him that power, but that power is something which comes from a very deep place. It comes from the deepest place and the deepest core of the person's neshama, especially if it's a tzaddik, like David HaMalach, the kings of Israel, the leaders of Israel. And this is something that's so deep, this way it's explained in Hasidus, it's so deep that even the person himself who wants to be a leader, he doesn't have the ability to bring that out of himself, that potential. It's something that's such a potential that only people outside of him could bring this out. This is a volume in Tanya Coach, second volume, Chirayur Yichud, where the author Rebbe also explains this at length. It says, Ein melabulayam. There is no king without a nation. It doesn't only mean you can't be a king if there's no one to be a king over. It means kingdom has to be brought out from the nation. That the people willingly and lovingly want this person to be their king. And that desire of the people brings out and draws out the potential from its potential state to be actual. So therefore, the king himself will actually not even feel that he has the potential because it's so deep. When people start requesting and, and sort of uh, drawing this out of him, he starts feeling it a little bit, but not complete, and definitely not complete enough to actually fully accept. And that's probably the explanation of what was going on. It's very hard to explain, but one of my Mashpi once gave a mushal, I thought it was a very good mushal, it gives me a little bit of an idea. And he said there was someone, I forgot the name, who was a world-renowned singer. Actually, he was a descendant of Rabbi Levi Yitzhak Badichev, but he wasn't a religious Jew, he was a singer. And he was staying in a hotel. And the free the Rebbe was staying in the same hotel. And he was rehearsing for a performance. So the free met him in the hallway, said, by the way, I heard you rehearsing and practicing for performance. I want to tell you that I noticed that in this, in this song, you, were, you had to go up another 16th of a note a little bit higher. So he said to the free you're right, but it's a very, very difficult note to, to come out with. But I'm not worried, but I'm going to be on stage. And there'll be 5,000 people sitting there. It's going to come out. In other words, I can't get that to come out. It's, you need much more for it to come out. But when I'll be seeing 5,000 people that have confidence in me and they're waiting for it to happen, it's going to come out. And this is the same idea that Malchus, kingdom, and especially when you study Hasidus, Malchus is which sphere? The first, the second, the third? Which one is it? What? It's the last. But it said the Hasidus, Malchus is rooted higher than all the spheres. It's rooted in Keser, in the crown. Its essence actually is higher than all the ten spheres, even higher than Chachma. So it's so deep in the soul that the only way it could come out is from the nation by bringing it out. And again, kingdom could be two possibilities. And one of them is real, one is not. There are people that rule a country, but they're not real kings. They're dictators. They rule with force, with threatening, with killing people that don't listen to them, like communism, all these Arab countries where they have dictators, you don't listen to them, they just kill you. So of course everybody says, sure, whatever you say, that's what I'll do. They have elections, everybody votes for them, strange enough. Everybody votes because they're afraid if they don't vote for the right person, they'll be killed. This kind of thing is called memshala. Memshala means rulership, but not kingdom. It's ruling by force. But kingdom is when there's actually a relationship between the people and the king. It's a relationship of love, where they love the king, and the king loves them, and they want the best for the king, and the king wants the best for them. And whatever he does is for the purpose of discipline, holding the country together. The king is there to enhance our life, enhance our life as a community. It's not about just him being ruling over other people. So it's a very deep, genuine uh, power, which is Malchus, and that needs to be brought out by the people. And Hasidus says this is a muscle to understand Hashem's kingdom, that Hashem is also the same thing. His power of kingdom is hidden, and by us davening on Rosh Hashanah. And if you think for a moment, if you don't remember, go back to the Machzor, and you'll see every other prayer is Hashem, you are a king, you will be a king, you are a king, and you are a king, and you will be a king, and your kingdom is forever, and your king ahead, and your king ahead, and your king once, and your king again. 
we're constantly talking about Hashem's kingdom because what we're doing is we're telling Hashem, we want you to be our king. We love you to be our king. We're accepting you as a king willingly. And that brings out Hashem's kingdom in the world from a hidden potential state to a revealed state. That is the gist of it. I guess there's any questions, we're ready. Yep. Have a few minutes. Are there yeah. any other souls except from the children or whatever that have this leadership pushed upon them in our history? Mm -hmm. there's only two a, a, no, there's no? a lot, a lot. A lot. In Gemara, there's a story with Rabbah. And when he wanted Rabbah to be the next leader, not only he said no, he ran away to a different country to hide. They had to send people to Mitzrayim, where he ran, to pull him back to accept the position of leadership. So most of the tzaddikim really refused to accept leadership unless it was sort of the people expressed enough how much they wanted and that's what they accepted. Yes? Uh, like the Rebbe was appointed as a Rebbe and uh, uh -huh. another 10 minutes and you'll have lunch, don't worry, 10 minutes. <laughs> And the royalty also on the royalty. So, do we know like the royalty's reaction of all this process? Because once I heard that the royalty, like she stays more at home, like for compassion of, of her sister, like is that true or like do we know whatever reaction did she have? Like about the Rebbe's position of leadership, yeah, and also of her becoming like the royalty. Oh, the Rebetzin, more than any other Rebetzin, like Yitzvah is also the Rebetzin, Rivka's yard say, the, She was the wife of the Rebbe Marash. So she was involved in certain communal things. And the same with other, our Rebetzin was hardly seen. I mean, again, she's someone that on a human level, she could have had all the honor in the world. And the whole world is focused on the Rebbe. And see, people don't even know who she was and what she looked like. She hardly... Even when she came to 770, because her sister, that sister, which is called Hannah, lived upstairs, she wouldn't go through the front door. She went down to the basement. There's an elevator there. And from the elevator, she went up to the third floor. So a, a few times, I happened to be there when she came, and I saw her. One time, I went to the house. By the way, Machon, Machon Hannah, which used to be uh, every year, twice a year, one of the students went to the Rebetzin. Why was it? Once was on Purim to bring Shalach Manis, and the other time was on the Rebbe Rebetzin's uh, anniversary, the girls would do something, a project, put together an album of all the students, or a cake, something, and they'd bring it as a gift. How did we get such a privilege? <laughs> because the woman used to cook at the dorm, an older woman, she was close to the Rebetzin, and she has permission for the girls to come. And from then, it became a regular thing. Wow. So the Rebetzin was like that, but they actually say the Rebetzin, the Rebetzin's life was very different once the Rebbe became Rebbe. You know, being the wife of a Rebbe means very little time for yourself. But you actually encouraged and say the Rebetzin was one of the people who encouraged the Rebbe to take on the position of leadership. So when the Rebbe had Fabrengans till three, four o'clock in the morning, she wouldn't go to sleep until the Rebbe came home. And, and, uh, and uh, I remember one time there was a Fabrengan where the Rebbe said, I think I told you a story when we spoke about when the Rebbe had the heart attack, that um, the doctors persisted the Rebbe must go to a hospital, his life is in danger, it's a very massive heart attack, and uh, the Rebbe didn't want to go, and then at one point they gave a certain medication to calm down the heart, and the Rebbe was sleeping. So they told the Rebbe, so now is the moment that we can do something and take the Rebbe to the hospital, even though he doesn't want. But we need your consent. And the Rebbe doesn't want. So they told her that you should know that if you don't give your consent and something happens, you'll be responsible. She heard those words. She became very serious. And she said, give me a moment. She turned around and faced the wall. And for a few moments, she was thinking. Then she turned around and said, I never in my life did anything different than my husband's will, and I'm not going to do it now either. He's staying here. Wow. So that was where the Rebetzin stood. Why she was more hidden than all the others, I don't know, but that's that was obviously has to do with her function and her role. Wow. Yes. 
Why was there this back and forth with Rabbi? I understand you saying how in order for a leader to be functioning, be in this position, he needs people. But that still doesn't explain like the back and forth that the Rabbi had, like you're saying, wearing, getting rid of the jacket, but like wearing the black hat, and then like all these little hints that he gave, like you were saying, mixed signals, like. So, so maybe I'm not sure. It really, I'm not qualified even to give an answer because we don't understand these things. And unless it's written somewhere, oh, we can't even guess these things. But I'm going to guess anyway. <laughs> with that introduction, with that disclaimer, it could be that there are certain aspects of leadership, which maybe this is more the technical part of it let's say organizing things and leading people, giving people advice, certain aspects of leadership, which perhaps this is something that didn't require that full, full feeling of Rebbe, which the Rebbe wanted to feel, to the point of saying a mimer. And therefore, the fact that people asked the Rebbe to, for leadership, and he, and he heard it from the people, it brought something out. And that something was, was which empowered him to do those things which he did but still not the full acceptance of leadership because it wasn't, it wasn't yet at that point. It also could be, and I think I saw somewhere, it says that for the neshama in a tzaddik of that caliber, that this position of leadership should be fully developed, could take 12 months. And that could be the reason why the Rebbe waited. In other words, he did not feel, when the Rebbe said the words, I don't feel it, he meant it. I don't feel it. He didn't feel it until it was, that potential was fully developed in him. Vicky, you want to say something? Oh, yeah. That, as we've seen, like, in the history of Kama, like, whenever, like, a, one of the rain, like, wasn't, like, a, physically alive, like, then the, another, the, the other, like, went after him. So, like, after he met them, like, nobody, like, even, like, dared to, like, look for another one. Like, did they really, like, in his lifetime, like, acknowledge, like, what will happen, like, after? Yeah, or... that's the reason why. First of all, you'll hear from people, there's nobody who we think could take that position. I mean, I once heard somebody uh, speak. He actually wasn't a Chabad Chassid. He was a very big Rosh Hashiva, lived in Montreal. And he said, when Moshe Rabbeinu was gone, what did they took a, uh, they made a golden calf. Because they said, we need a leader. So he said, why did they take a golden calf? Why didn't they choose somebody there that should take his position of leadership? So he said, I, they understood that the only one who's going to stand in the place of Moshe Rabbeinu is a behemoth. Who else would stand in the place of Moshe Rabbeinu? Only a cow could think of doing that. He meant to say, there's nobody there that can stand in Moshe Rabbeinu's position. So people say, who do we have today that's of that kind of spiritual caliber? That, that's one thing. But it's not that. It's more that the Rebbe himself didn't once speak about it. It was shortly after the Rebbeitsen passed away, Chavay Shvat. A very famous Sikha Bez Adar. The Sikha is found on recording, it's in writing, and they ever spoke about what will happen in such a time. And one of the things he said, he didn't say the words, it shouldn't be a successor, but he said, what will, should people do with their questions? And by what the Rebbe said we should do, we understood what we shouldn't do. And he said that in each community, if there are certain questions where they have, which normally would be addressed to the Rebbe, they should address these questions to the Bezdin, the Hasidic and Bezdin of their community. And with that talk, the Rebbe made clear two things. Number one, that there should be nobody appointed in this place. And number two, that even as a Bezdin, a group of rabbis, there shouldn't be a central command of all Chabad around the world, but each community should go to the rabbis of their community. And that's what he said. Uh, only time he ever spoke about it. How did we know he was speaking about it? Because he used certain words. He didn't, the Rebbe would never pronounce such a thing, but he used certain words which implied what would be after. Very famous. That's what he said. Okay, so um, I'm wishing everybody a good Shabbos and should they get the most of it. And uh, of course, we're asking for Mashiach and have all, everybody back again with Ashes. Amen.